Good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Pepin. I'm the Boston City Councilor for District 5, and I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on City Services and Technology Innovation. Today is Monday, October 7th, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash city council dash TV and broadcasted on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Files Channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.csit at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called in order in which they signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you're interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you are looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Ron Cobb at ron.cobb at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket number 1130, order for a hearing to implement community safe road and birth control to protect Boston families, companion animals, and wildlife. This matter was sponsored by myself and our council president, Ruti louis Jen, and was referred to the committee on July 10th, 2024. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Calera Zapata, Councillor louis Jen, Councillor Fitzgerald. At this moment, I would like to give my colleagues an opportunity to provide quick opening remarks, starting with the original, one of the original co-sponsors of this bill, Council President Louis John. Thank you, Council Pepin, and thank you to everyone for being here this morning for us to discuss uh, rat birth control among uh, the many things that we're discussing as a city council to address the city's rodent population. We know that um, this is a council that cares deeply about addressing the basic uh, everyday issues that our residents bring to us, one of them being rat, uh, rodent issues. And so we've talked about how do we improve our waste uh, uh, management to uh, reduce uh, shelter and food sources for rodents. How do we uh, you know, try to get the back supply of, of dry ice? So many things that we've been doing. Uh, here today we're going to be talking about uh, rodent control, and I just want to shout out the JP neighborhood and Elena and everyone um, who we've been working with uh, to see if rat birth control is uh, a, a possible solution. And I want to also thank the city of Boston, uh, ISD, um, Environmental Services, uh, everyone who has really helped us, John, uh, who has really been central to helping us find solutions here to our road and problem in the city of Boston. So thank you, thank you again to my colleagues, to everyone who's been working on this, and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy? Um, thank you to the panelists here and also the city experts who have been working on this for a long time. I've been on several rat walks across the city like many of us have and know that you know it's a quality of life issue, not just the fear that some people have um, and the nuisance, but just also the negative health impacts that it has. So we've been talking about this since I've been on the council, different options, looking forward to this conversation to see if this is one more tool, you know, we can put into our toolbox. It's never just one um, thing that's going to address this concern that some neighbors um, would say is like overtaking, right? People are moving out because of it. It's, it's gotten so bad in some areas. So looking forward to the conversation and seeing how we can, my office, but also this body can help to continue to support going forward how we take control. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Colera Zapata. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate you all for being here. I represent incredibly dense neighborhoods where folks and restaurants live in cro close proximity. So um, I am always curious about how we are being innovated, innovative and creative as a city to mitigate this issue, try to solve for it. I know that we're not the only municipality in the world that is dealing with pests and rodents. And so what are we doing uh, to partner with our sister cities, looking at what they're doing to be um, 
successful in our, in our ongoing fight against the rats and, and the rodents. I know in April we held a similar hearing on an ordinance where the administration was talking about their incredible efforts, so look forward to hearing their testimony and about uh, some of the work that's already happened. Um, and I know that this is a conversation that has to strike that delicate balance between uh, making sure that we are solving for this rodent crisis, but also being aware and cognizant of the ecosystem around it and making sure that they are healthy and, and maintaining their um, important value in, in, our, in Boston's ecosystem. So I look forward to the conversation. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, look forward to this conversation, learning more about the, the birth control uh, for rats. And of course, in Dorchester, we've, uh, we certainly get a lot of calls about this as well. So just happy to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Rubber. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you to the panelists for being here. Uh, as a representative of and, and, a, and a resident of Jamaica Plain, I am um, excited to learn about the, the pilot program there and, and figure out ways that we can uh, combat the, the rodent problem uh, in ways that, that does the, the least amount of harm uh, to everyone else. Uh, so thanks for this and thanks for calling this hearing. Thank you. Councilor Braden. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm from Alston Brighton. It is one of the neighborhoods that has the highest uh, recorded sort of rat sightings and we have a big, a very serious problem, but um, I do appreciate the importance of trying to um, adapt um, interventions that do not cause harm to other wildlife and to humans as well. Um, I had great hopes for the coyotes. We had an increased coyote population, but they didn't seem to get the memo that they were meant to go after rats, but um, yes, uh, so I'm really interested in your conversation this morning and to learn more about how um, um, rodent birth control might be a possible strategy for us in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I'd just like to start by also saying thank you to the panelists that we have here today. Um, thank you to the city administration for being here. I see Chief Irish, John Oric, and Antonio Del Rio. Um, seriously, everyone's input today is so important because we know that the issue of rodents impacts everyone, and it impacts our quality of life, it impacts the cleanliness of our city. So I'm just very um, thankful that you've all decided to take some time out of your day to tell us about the work you are doing, which is why now I would like to give the opportunity for you guys to quickly introduce yourselves and you all have the opportunity to give your presentations. Um, if, if we want to start here and move, move your way down with just state your name in the organization you are representing and then we'll go from there. Good morning, my name is Elena Gonzalez-White and I represent Wisdom Good Works. Wisdom Good Works is a 501c3 nonprofit established to provide alternatives to lethal and poisonous approaches to wildlife population management, which have been the failing status quo for the last several hundred years. We do this by investing in scientific research and sharing our expertise in the development of real-world applications of fertility control measures, which aim to make the world a safer place for all inhabitants, including the constituents of Boston, our children, our pets, our endangered members of the food chain, yes, even safer for the rats, because by extension, the predators that naturally combat their growing numbers deserve an unpoisoned food source. Past attempts to apply fertility control to rats at the city level have failed because available products at the time of study failed to follow the science of the behavior of the world's fastest breeding mammal on earth, while taking into consideration that delivery must withstand the changing seasons and weather patterns of the location. Any product that used must meet the requirements of the intended target. If the food is what an urban rat seeks, let's work with the rat. For a product to compete with natural resources that abound wherever humans live, you must make it continuously easily available, the best tasting, and of course, efficacious. Above all, it must be safer for anyone who comes into contact with it. To that end, we have developed Wisdom Good Bites. I brought some for everybody to see. <laughs> it's a solid feed pellet. Um, and it meets all the nutritional requirements of the rat with an active ingredient that makes them infertile. This plant-derived, non-toxic, functional food is a better long-term alternative to poison, which barely and only temporarily slows the growth of their population. Good Bites have shown promise in an area of study in Jamaica Plain. 
Over the course of a 13-month study window from August 2023 to August 2024, we monitored a two-block area including 31 individual properties. We monitored weekly, noting that in the first three months, consumption increased. This indicates a building trust from a notoriously untrusting individual, the rat, um, and reliability on the new food source that was placed near trash, storage, and in yards. After peak consumption was reached, we measured the decrease in amount consumed over time, corroborated with camera trapping at interval to measure decrease in rodent population in 10 out of the last 11 months. Decline has been held between 50 and 60% steadily, with the highest decrease measured at 70% this August. While a lethal knockdown strategy can expect a full rebound at 20 to 24 weeks, Good Bites application has showed repeated, sustained success over time. We applaud the City of Boston for the support they've extended during this year-long study. However, we feel the rodent action plan put forth by the city does not go far enough to invest resources in expanding on the success we've demonstrated in Jamaica Plain. The residents of Jamaica Plain have demonstrated this success to show an important first step has been taken in ridding Massachusetts of harmful poisons and repeated half measures. Fertility control is a proactive approach that is a 21st century solution to an age-old problem. We'd also like to thank Councillor Pepin, Council President Louis Jean, along with John Ulrich of ISD for their support and our mission to provide impactful solutions for facing the monumental yet achievable task of ur urban rodent population reduction. We urge you to join the co-sponsors of today's panel in supporting a proactive and sustainable approach as part of Boston's rodent action plan moving forward. And Wisdom Good Works remains ready to assist however we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Good morning, Councillor Pepin, President Louis Jean, members of the committee. My name is Sam Anderson. I'm the Director of Legislative and Government Affairs for Mass Audubon. With over 160,000 members, Mass Audubon is New England's largest member based conservation organization. Mass Audubon members hail from all 351 cities and towns across the state, including several hundred individuals and families residing in Boston. Our Boston Nature Center in Mattapan provides access to 67 acres of woodland for the neighborhood in addition to camps, adult programs, nature-based educational programming in schools, and a 300-plot community garden. We're proud of our presence in the city of Boston, and I'm excited to be here today in an advocacy capacity to talk about our work to reduce the use of rodenticides across the state. As part of Mass Audubon's commitment to addressing the biodiversity crisis through organizing and mobilizing at the grassroots level, we've established our Rescue Raptors program, which provides support and resources to community groups looking to reduce eschar use in their neighborhoods through landowner education and state and local advocacy. While our focus is on getting rid of rat poisons, I would say for the record that population management techniques uh, like uh, those at Wisdom Good Works um, are a crucial element of any poison-free integrated pest management strategy. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given our statewide reach and our membership's affinity for birds, the Rescue Raptors program has proven extremely popular. In just over a year, we have established partnerships with over 50 local and regional groups committed to reducing eschar use in their communities. The energy and passion people have for this issue across the state is palpable. Of course, people want their neighborhoods free from rodents and pests, but the sight of the ubiquitous poison black boxes and the thought that the red-tailed hawk circling overhead uh, is more than likely mortally ill causes residents to consider the alternatives and drives them to action. The logic of the situation resonates. It uh, drives people crazy to walk down the sidewalk in Boston and see piles of trash next to boxes of rat poison. There are better ways to manage rodents than to use poison as a first line of defense, and the city of Boston has an opportunity to make a real impact beyond just leading by example. We often advise our local advocates to start their organized advocacy by engaging the large landowners in their hometowns. Convincing a strip mall or a large housing development to move away from rat poison can decrease the risk to wildlife in one big swing. In many cases, the largest landowner is the city or the town itself, and in Boston, that is no different. The city itself owns some 13% of the land, and taking poisons out of our parks, our schools, our public housing, and our roadways and sidewalks makes sense ecologically, and it's good public health policy. 
my ornithologists tell me that we're systematically killing the best available and cheapest defense against rodents that we've got. Uh, Councillor Braden mentioned the coyotes. Um, I, I get very nervous to think about coyotes running around eating <laughs> poison rats in Brighton. Uh, they also tell me, importantly, that uh, uh, rodent birth control uh, has no secondary effects on predator species, um, which is a question we get asked a lot um, from our members and our partner advocacy groups. With that, I'd be happy to take questions now or serve as a resource in the future uh, as you continue your hard work on this important topic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Great. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It is all from our perspective. I'm, I'm Zach Mertz, by the way, the CEO of the New England Wildlife Centers. We are a local nonprofit. We run two wildlife hospitals um, in Massachusetts, one on the Cape and one in Weymouth that serves the city of Boston every day. We work with Boston Parks Department very closely. Um, and in this role, we have really an upfront seat to the inner workings and machinations of what's going on with wildlife populations in the city of Boston. And the reason I'm excited today is um, it's time this issue got more attention. It, it's something in the rehab world we've been dealing with on and off for 15, 20 years. Um, it's a pernicious problem. It's a horrible, pro horrible problem to see an animal up close that's been poisoned by second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. Um, even today, with more awareness, we still see probably 50 to 100 cases per year. Um, some of those animals do come to us from downtown, um, especially in densely populated areas where people are doing rodent proofing, and especially this time of year when uh, people are getting ready for the winter. And so when we get an animal in that has been in contact with escars, just for ease of um, getting it out of my mouth this morning, um, we can see a whole host of symptoms. It can be something chronic where the animal is really just not functioning, meaning it's not feeling well and it's, it's really not able to fill its niche or hunt effectively, all the way up to acute exposure, where this animal can be quite honestly comatose, bleeding out. I, I don't want to get too graphic, but um, we had a patient a few weeks ago came in ble bleeding out of every orifice. Um, just simply on the verge of death, and even with emergency blood transfusions, we weren't able to turn that, <coughs> that animal around. And so, as a rehabilitation, as a veterinary facility, our concern is the length of the time we've been seeing this problem, and also the resources that it takes to turn one of these animals around. The average time at our hospital, uh, I'll take a great horned owl we got from uh, the Arboretum, I think last year, it took about 90 days for us to get the poison in that bird's system to the point where it was no longer detectable, meaning that bird's bl blood was clotting an appropriate amount of time. And that's about the average. I would say about 90 days is, is the standard, but it has taken us up to 365 days in some cases. We had a family of great horned owls, and I'll, I'll share this example quickly. Um, they lived in a tree, very normal great horned owl nest. One of the parents got a hold of a single poison rodent uh, that had been exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides. It brought that meal back to the nest. Both siblings in the nest, the father, the mother, made a meal of this rat, and three out of the four perished. And so we took this last remaining uh, baby great horned owl, we had to go up in a bucket truck to retrieve it, brought it in, gave it a blood transfusion. We necropsied the rest of the family, and definitively they had died from escars. It took us a full 365 days to care for this animal. We had to do daily vet checks. We did blood transfusions, vitamin K treatments. Uh, and in that time, that single baby owl, this is a young owl, ate 2,000 rats and mice in our care. So that can show you the potential for natural rodent control that these animals can exert. The red-tailed hawks, the owls, it is incredible. Nature is extremely efficient. And so as we look to control a rodent population here in the city, we need to be thinking about our natural assets as well as just these chemical short-term solutions. And the rodent birth control, I think, is an incredibly powerful tool in that toolbox, meaning it may not be the most immediate solution, but when in, used in conjunction with other IPM strategies, it's going to have a lasting effect, and it's going to have an effect that is not essentially kneecapping nature's ability to handle this. Um, so I just wanted to say, as from a rehabber standpoint, a lot of resources goes into every animal. It's a burden to those who volunteer to care for the wildlife in this state. Um, and we're very excited to, at the prospect of this uh, passing.
Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to present my testimony. My name is Dr. Martha Smith Blackmore. I'm a veterinarian. I provide veterinary care at the City of Boston Animal Care and Control Facility in Roslindale. I'm also a former 15-year resident of East 6th Street and a property owner there in South Boston. Rachel Carson once said, in nature, nothing exists alone. And she observed that we, as human animals, when we wage war against nature, we wage war against ourselves. This is particularly true when we talk about the poisons we set out to kill rats. As a shelter veterinarian providing services for the city, I regularly see birds of prey, particularly red-tailed hawks, brought in by Boston's dedicated animal control officers, sick and dying. Frequently, these gorgeous birds are weak and anemic and struggling to breathe through open beaks. More often than not, the raptor is too far gone, and my only option is to euthanize them to bring their struggle and suffering to an end. Veterinarians and other animal caregivers struggle with a heavy burden. We enter our field as a response to a calling. We give of ourselves to care for animals because we love them, only to discover that a great deal of our work is fighting against the harms that people ca can cause animals. Our profession of compassion turns into a weary task of killing. Every shelter agent in that shelter in Roslindale loves their work and is incredibly dedicated. They too are heartbroken by the numbers of birds that come into the shelter in distress. This is a burden that is borne by the employees of the city of Boston, in part caused by the poisons that are laid down by the city of Boston. I mentioned numbers. I asked the Director of Animal Care and Control, Alexis Trzinski, to pull the numbers for birds of prey brought in by animal control officers over the past five years. Since 2019, 199 hawks, falcons, and owls have been brought into the City of Boston Shelter for Care. Only 20% are strong enough to undergo transfer to the New England Wildlife Center for potential life-saving care. Some, of course, are injured, hit by cars, or electrocuted by power lines. But some of the injured birds get injured because they're too sick, too, sick, too weak from previous anticoagulant rodenticide exposure used to kill rats. As an aside, not only is the city putting out this awful poison that kills rats in a suffering way, and this poison works its way through the food chain to kill raptors, who ironically provide us with great rat control services, the city also uses inhumane glue traps, which causes another horrifying type of suffering. Perhaps we can do away with those as well if we turn to birth control. Rat population must be controlled. They're a nuisance that impacts the quality of life in the city. They also pose a public health risk. One disease in particular, leptospirosis, causes liver and kidney failure. It can be fatal. Dogs, especially exposed to rat urine, which is how leptospirosis is transmitted, can also give it to the people they come into contact with. Tufts Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine just recently issued a warning that lepto levels are quite high right now. But herein lies the rub. Poisoned rats are immune suppressed and more likely to spread lepto. Rats on birth control are healthy, but not reproducing. Fewer rats, less lepto. And importantly, birds of prey won't be exposed to the poison that is killing them and causing emotional harm to city employees. I'll close with one more Rachel Carson quote. The human race is challenged more than ever before to demonstrate our mastery, not over nature, but of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Boston City Councilors. My name is Lexi Nealon. I'm a third year student at Harvard Law School and a former clinician with the Harvard Law School Animal Law and Policy Clinic. ALPC and its clients welcome the Council's interest in implementing humane and community safe alternatives to rodenticides, including the use of contraceptives to control rodent populations. We emphasize, however, that the city's implementation of humane alternatives must be coupled with a phasing out of the use of rodenticides, especially anticoagulant rodenticides, to reap the full environmental and public health benefits of any such program. 
Anticoagulant rodenticides are highly toxic chemicals that not only target rodents, but also pose a serious threat to non-target species, including pets, wildlife, and even humans through primary and secondary poisoning. There are numerous documented cases in Massachusetts of local wildlife, including bald eagles and other species protected by state and federal law, falling victim to anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning after consuming poisoned rodents. Because these chemicals work slowly, the delay between rodents' ingestion and their onset of symptoms increases the risk of secondary poisoning to predators, such as raptors, foxes, and coyotes. Additionally, anticoagulant rodenticides injure companion animals, such as dogs and cats, who often require costly veterinary care to treat their poisoning. These chemicals are also toxic to humans. Many people, particularly children, are exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides every year. In Massachusetts alone, there were almost 200 cases of human anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning between the years of 2021 and 2023, many of them occurring among children under the age of six. Continued use of anticoagulant rodenticides thus increases the risk of unintended consequences to human health, especially among those most vulnerable in society. The phasing out of anticoagulant rodenticides is necessary to protect Massachusetts residents, companion animals, and wildlife. The state of California has recognized these dangers and prohibited the use of all anticoagulant rodenticides within the state, with limited exceptions, setting a precedent for cities like Boston to follow suit in protecting both wildlife and public health. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has proposed additional restrictions on the use of anticoagulant rodenticides under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, as well as the Endangered Species Act. Furthermore, ALPC believes that the registration and use of anticoagulant rodenticides violates our state's standards under the Massachusetts Pesticide Control Act, or MPCA. While the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources considers ALPC's petition to suspend state registration of anticoagulant rodenticides, Boston has an opportunity to set a positive example for our state by phasing out anticoagulant rodenticides and instead in adopting humane alternatives to manage rodent populations. As detailed in the enclosed petition, it is ALPC's position that anticoagulant rodenticides do not meet the MPCA standard for registration because they generally cause unreasonable adverse effects to the environment. Under the MPCA, unreasonable adverse effects to the environment means an unreasonable risk to man or the environment, taking into account the economic, social, and environmental costs and benefits of the use of any pesticide. The environment includes water, air, land, and all plants and man and other living animals therein and the interrelationships which exist among these. The risks posed by a pesticide product to human health or the environment are unreasonable where they are not outweighed by the pesticide's benefits. Allowing anticoagulant rodenticides to continue to kill our wildlife, especially protected species, is inherently unreasonable because it undermines longstanding conservation efforts, jeopardizes ecosystem health, and deprives society of the cultural and economic benefits those species provide. In particular, the harm inflicted by anticoagulant rodenticides on bald eagles and other raptors is an unreasonable adverse effect on the environment. Raptors play a vital role in maintaining healthy ecosystems by regulating prey populations. By indiscriminately killing eagles and other raptors, anticoagulant rodenticides interfere with the ecosystem's natural ability to control rodent populations. As discussed by other panelists, anticoagulant rodenticides also pose significant threats to companion animals, and there is substantial state and nationwide data documenting cases of anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning in humans. Even if anticoagulant rodenticides were effectively managing Boston's rodent population, that benefit would not outweigh the substantial negative impacts to humans, wildlife, and domestic animals, and cannot be justified in light of the availability of humane alternatives, such as rodent contraceptives. ALPC believes that the MPCA's balancing test 
weighs in favor of replacing anticoagulant rodenticides with these humane alternatives, such as a citywide rodent contraceptive program. We respectfully urge the council to phase out the use of anticoagulant rodenticides in Boston and instead reallocate resources toward humane pest control alternatives such as rodent birth control. By taking this step, Boston will help lead the charge in protecting our environment, safeguarding public health, and ensuring the humane treatment of all creatures. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. Thank you. I know we have one more that is joining us virtually. Um, Dr. Kiko, can you hear us? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. The mic is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kara Holmquist. I'm the Director of Advocacy at the MSPCA, and I'm here with Dr. Kiko Bracker, who runs our uh, emergency uh, care unit. Uh, we work at the MSPCA Angel Animal Medical Center. Um, in addition to shelters, law enforcement, and our advocacy programs, we work, run uh, two animal hospitals, one in Jamaica Plain and one in Waltham. And we are here to testify in favor, um, like the other panelists, of promoting rodent birth control and moving away from rodenticides. Uh, I want to thank the City Council for having this hearing and also for allowing Dr. Bracker uh, to testify remotely so he can continue um, seeing his caseload. Uh, we see about 80,000 uh, client visits at our two hospitals, and we see a variety of different types of poisoning, uh, eschars and other poisoning, other rodenticides. Um, and Dr. Bracker is going to testify to the suffering of the animals and the cost to owners. We've heard a little bit so far, um, but just how difficult this can be when uh, pets uh, get into rodenticide. So thank you. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this meeting today. Uh, when dogs are exposed to rodenticides, we see them usually after it's one, one of two scenarios, either it's simple exposure prior to cl clinical signs or once they're showing clinical signs and signs of toxicity. If it's just a matter of exposure, then we can go ahead and try to uh, eliminate the toxin from their system, usually by inducing vomiting uh, or, or some other me measures that can be used. But if they're showing toxic signs, then we have to identify the type of toxin, see if there's an antidote, and then go on down treatment methods, which are Un unpredictable at, at best. Um, neurotoxins like bromethylene uh, are often fatal and there's no antidote for that. Uh, although SGARs do have a treatment method, uh, it's kind of a question of timing uh, and uh, financial investment, quite honestly, from the owner because treatment can end up being expensive. Uh, with SGARs, uh, bleeding begins usually in about three to seven days after exposure, after eating a to toxic dose from this. Uh, and so it really is a, a question of timing and uh, a race against the clock. Uh, treatment involves uh, giving vitamin K, uh, which takes about 12, 24 hours to have a positive effect, as well as uh, fairly aggressive transfusions of blood and plasma. And plasma can serve to give them back effective clotting factors that can allow them to form a, a useful clot. Uh, the cost of care can often run into the thousands of dollars, uh, easily between three and seven thousand thousand dollars with those blood transfusions. Usually, hospitalization will last uh, on the short side from forty-eight hours, maybe up to uh, four, four days or so, uh, if, if if treatment is successful. Uh, at our hospital, we see about forty to fifty cases of rodenticide toxicity per year, uh, and over the last four years. Uh, we've seen 180 cases of uh, rodenticide toxicity total between our two hospitals. Uh, in, in that period of time, 14 of those were confirmed uh, anticoagulant rodenticides, which required blood transfusions and were, were conf confirmed toxicities of that sort. One uh, case report that I'd, I'd like to share with you uh, was the case of Murphy, who was a middle-aged dog that we saw through our emergency room in 2021. And he came with the left side of his body being paralyzed. And it appeared like it was some sort of a stroke-like episode. So we were able to take him to an MRI scan uh, and look at his brain and spinal cord. And there seemed to be what looked like evidence of hemorrhage in those areas, which is not something we would have predicted or would commonly see. 
So then through further testing, we identified that he was not able to clot appropriately and then made the leap to saying this is likely an anticoagulant redenticide toxicity. Uh, so we then did uh, give him vitamin K and transfused with plasma and blood, uh, but still it takes 12, 24 hours for the bleeding problem to resolve and, and stop bleeding. And during that period of time where we were waiting for him to clot appropriately, he did have a cataclysmic and ultimately fatal bleed uh, within his brain, and he did pass away from that issue despite trying CPR and trying to resuscitate him. Uh, at necropsy, we identified two different types of anticoagulant redenticides that had precipitated in his liver, uh, which was an, uh, kind of an odd finding and fairly significant. Uh, his owners, of course, were terribly distraught by this and had really no idea where his exposure would have happened because they did not have those uh, anticoagulants in their household. Uh, ultimately, the cost of Murphy's treatment ended up being over $7,000. And again, he did not survive that, that, uh, that treatment episode. So that's just a way of uh, demonstrating to you the toll that can be exerted upon veterinary patients, dogs, and potentially cats who may come into inadvertent contact with SGARs and other anticoagulant redenticides. Thanks. Thank you, doctor. Um, just again, thank you so much for all the panelists for being here and giving your testimonies and your um, val valued input. But today, um, right now, I would like to um, give the opportunity to my colleagues to ask your questions. I'm going to start with four minutes for questions. Um, but obviously, if we have more questions, we could do another round. Um, we'll start with one of the co-sponsors, um, Council President Luija. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to all of the panelists for um, the incredible work that you all are doing. Um, thank you for elevating and for teaching me some new things during um, your presentation. I want to shout out Dr. Smith Blackmore, Blackmore for elevating the work of our animal control um, uh, department led by Alex, Alexis Trzinski, who won the Shattuck Award for the city last last year. Um, they do incredible work and don't have the resources uh, to do the work that they do. And so just want to lift up that entire department. I have a question for whoever can answer it. Um, a lot of, and when I, when I read the, the brief from um, the HLS Animal Law and Policy Clinic and when I just listened to the good doctor, um, it, the focus seems to be in on anticoagulant rodenticides, um, other rodenticides where, where like the ones that the chemical based rodenticide or other forms of rodenticide, are we okay with those? Are they less toxic, I guess? I, they're less toxic to a l larger wildlife, to humans. I'm happy to address this one. Mm -hmm. um, the focus uh, on anticoagulant rodenticides um, in the petition that the ALPC put out um, was in light of the fact that in Massachusetts over 96% of the rodenticides used in the state are anticoagulant rodenticides. So when we're looking at the overwhelming majority of the impact, our focus is on FGARs and SGARs. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if it, yep. I would just like to add um, that I endorse uh, the 96% and also the 100% of raptors that are tested uh, show positive. But also, if we eradicate uh, the anticoagulants, the other chemical poisons that could come in are also dangerous to the entire food chain and also pose problems. So non-poison pathways are the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I want to gear the rest of my questions towards you, Elena, and the work that you've been doing. I saw a spot on some channel about people of Malden and, or Medford wanting or dentist, wanting a rat birth control, and, and you were on it. And I want to thank you for the good work that you do. When we started, I think it was last year in my office, a number of rat projects in different neighborhoods, Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, um, and want to talk a little bit more on the data collection uh, behind uh, the rat uh, birth control pilot that's happening um, over on uh, Cranston Street in Jamaica Plain. If you could talk a little bit more about what data collection looks like to to monitor success or to determine what success looks like, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Um, we do think that one of the main tools missing in rodent control at a city level so far has been, sit, has been monitoring. Mm -hmm. It's imperative that you monitor the use of any measure taken. To that end, Wisdom Good Works has developed a proprietary data portal that it allows any user to, to make a measurement of consumption, to record it 
immediately that goes to a database that is going to be able to be shared with any of the stakeholders that need the information in real time. What that allows is my bosses, the scientists, to give actual um, direction, input, and, and help direct the design of those programs. Using the data portal and servicing a feeding station takes less than a minute. It is something that has become very apparent to us that time spent at service is going to be a big value. And to that end, the data monitoring portal allows us to reduce time. Thank you. And is the data monitoring panel, is that a, it's only uh, monitoring consumption? That's where we store the measurements of our consumption. It also takes into effect location. It geolocates each um, input made, and that takes into consideration time, date, weather patterns, um, moon phases if need be. But realistically, what it allows is a 360 picture or snapshot of what is happening in that location in real time. And can we measure infertility? Like, has it actually led to like infertility? You in can't the measure population? infertility through mm -hmm. consumption alone. But our model uses corroborated camera trapping as well. Mm -hmm. When you can measure a rodent population at less than 40% juvenile, what's indicated is a crashing and unsustainable growth within that population. OK, so that, uh, just enough data to show some sort of measurability of some success, Yes. although not measuring it. Camera trapping corroborates that. Via video. Okay. Thank you. I'll reserve my, my questions for the next round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam President. Um, okay, at this time we're going to go by order of arrival, and that starts with Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to this first panel for your sharing your expertise. And similar, my, my current family dog is Murphy, but my dog Winston did die from consuming poisonous blue pellets. So do know firsthand when you lose a family pet how devastating that is. But. Um, did want to talk about, and some of these I know will come up with the city panel also, but thinking about obviously the cost, the effectiveness of this, you know, what challenges are there to make sure that the rats actually eat it? And when I've gone on rat walks or just know from my own neighborhood that, you know, rats are smart, they'll find other food, and there's more than enough food in this city, and I've seen them, you know, eat through you know, expensive barrels that are stored properly. So the whole conversation about trash pickup and all of those other, like that will probably, that's never going to go away. So how do we make sure that this investment is going to then overall be the best solution for us going forward and how effective will it be? I don't mind taking that one sure. as well. Yeah. When you're talking about working with the animal, you have to make sure that what you use is preferential to those readily available food sources, right? Um, good bites are made out of food grade, human food grade ingredients that mimic the readily available trash sources they have. It has protein, it has carbohydrates, it has fats, it has peanut butter for attractiveness. Um, and what we have seen demonstrated is that when placed side by side with containerized garbage, the rat will prefer the easier meal. They want something at their level, on ground level. Um, what I've seen firsthand up on Cranston and Sheridan Street is that garbage cans that were replaced when they had been compromised before we started have not seen the decline, have, have lasted the duration of my study, and the rats are preferring it to the trash. Does anyone else want to touch on that? And how, like, how much would you think, though? I mean, this is a small study, which I'm glad we're doing it, but to actually cover the whole city. Like every a, single household next to you know, their barrel storage, like how near all of our restaurants and our dumpsters, like how much and what's the target that you would think to make this effective citywide? My recommendation is that you look to what a rodent's feeding range would be when deciding how closely to deploy feeding stations. Um, Obviously, where we've been working up in Cranston, we have used an absolute saturated amount just because we're learning what the city of Boston rats need and what they can consume. Um, we're not advocating that as heavy of an application as we've used there is necessarily the way to go. When you're designing a citywide or even a bigger city blueprint, we would work 
absolutely hand in, in step in step with city services, with city council to make sure that it's it's an application that is manageable and cost effective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Colera Zapata. Thank you, Chair. I just have um, one question, and I believe that is for you. Thank you so much, and just thank you, all of you, um, for your expertise. I really did learn a lot through your testimony, so just gratitude. Uh, you had mentioned that, and understanding that this is a partnership, we, there's always opportunity to do better. You had mentioned in your testimony that you are excited about the Boston Rodent Action Plan, uh, but had mentioned that you wish that the, sh the city could be doing more. Could you elaborate more on that and expand on that, just so we know moving forward when we're in conversations with our uh, partners in the administration, what that exactly means? Yeah, I think that even by commissioning the action plan, you guys have taken a really important step in addressing the situation and the problem at hand. Um, I think it was incredibly um, educational for people that might not otherwise know about what a city does to combat its rodent problem. Um, what I saw, though, is just I would say that it's not, it doesn't go far enough because it recommends containerization, which is an important step and part of an IPM protocol, but that's not going to be enough. Rats are able to chew through any surface up to the strength of steel. Unless you're containerizing all trash in steel containers, rats are going to be able to compromise that. So I think that if you are able to work with them and provide what they're seeking, which is nutrition, which is sustenance, but you do it in a way that is beneficial to, this, to the city, to the people that live here, um, I think that it provides a more comprehensive solution. And what is missing from that road and action plan is any step to, to apply that on a wider level or on a city level at all. Okay, thank you. That's it, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. Um, just three quick questions. Um, as a father of three, far be it from me to be the leading expert on birth control, but what I do know uh, is typically has to be taken at the same time every day. Is that correct? I know in, in humans, right? Or at least that's what's encouraged. Is that the same in this? Is there like a a certain timing that has to it has to be had and how do we make sure the rats are having it in that time frame that makes it work that's a great question I Thank think you. any any chance to further understand contraception by all people is important and you're right in a human you have you're suggested to take it at the same time every day the interval that we recommend for rodents is just that it's readily available on their feeding schedule there's enough of the active ingredient to remain contraceptive as long as they have regular access throughout the course of their life. Like a contraceptive a human would take, it can be reversible if, if feeding ceases. Um, and that's important because you don't want to talk about sterilizing an entire um, species. You get into a whole other realm of problems. But you do need to make it continuously available. Great, thank you. And that actually leads into my next question, which was more about um, it, say this was successful, is there anything, is there any sort of thing like a, a rat famine or shortage that we would have and what effect, like if this was 100% effective and, and rats were done, what is that effect on the ecosystem or a dramatic drop in yeah, the Yeah, if Boston were to demonstrate a rat famine, you would have every city knocking on your door asking how. <laughs> right, but, but, in but would all there be an ecosystem? Like, I mean, and what are the owls eating? What, like, how are we what, keeping the What other? we're going for is not total eradication. We're sure. going for balance. Yeah. When an ecosystem is in balance and the food is available for the hawks, you see the return of species that are otherwise disappearing. Just on Cranston, through my camera traps, I've seen birds of prey returning. I've seen coyotes. I've seen foxes. When you have that diverse ecosystem within an urban environment, you're demonstrating a system in balance. Gotcha. And no, absolutely. Please, please. Uh, so I, I, it's a very good question. Um, obviously, rats, rodents are at the bottom of our food chain. Um, and a lot of uh, raptors, predatory species, rely on that sustenance. Um, but I wanted to point out, uh, in the city of Boston, we're very lucky to have as much natural environment as we are throughout the Emerald Necklace. Um, a lot of these species we're talking about, the red-tailed hawks, the owls, uh, eagles, they have a reasonably large feeding range. 
Um, and we have a lot of natural areas that can sustain not just rats, but other rodents, shrews, moles, voles, things that also make up their diet uh, close by. Um, and as you pointed out, we're not looking at a total eradication. It's more of a balance. Um, we foresee this as sort of equalizing things a little bit more and um, spreading out the populations because we do, unfortunately, see um, artificial uh, gathering of some species when there's a lot of rodents in a single area. And if they're eating uh, rodents that are universally poisoned, I mean, there's one study out of Tufts University that showed 100% exposure to SCARs in the state of, of about 100 patients that were tested. Um, so we actually think this would have a bit of the opposite effect in, in sort of regaining a natural balance. Great. Thank you. And then, um, Lexi, I believe this one, this would be probably for you, but I, I know the, the, the EPA was proposing reclassifying the anticoagulant <laughs> rodenticides for restricted use. It, I assume that's a federal thing. Is that anything at the state and city level as well? Um, and what does restricted mean in that case? Like, in what circumstances would you be allowed to use the anticoagulants versus the not? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> I'll start with the second half of that question first at the state level. Um, at the state level, we have our petition pending before the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. We're hopeful that um, they will see our view that the continued registration of anticoagulant rodenticides violates the MPCA. However, there are also a number of local um, citizen petitions in front of um, municipalities around um, Boston, for example. I believe Arlington has banned the use of anticoagulant rodenticides um, in response to citizen interest in the issue. Um, <clears throat> at the federal level, EPA is currently proposing to reclassify um, anticoagulant rodenticides for restricted use, which means that they would only be able to be applied um, by certified um, applicators and also um, they're going to put, the proposal currently includes a number of restrictions on the, the use and of um, anticoagulant rodenticides, for example, where they can be placed. I believe there are geographic restrictions from um, wild areas as well as um, particularly dense areas and homes. Um, another aspect of the proposal that I can recall from the top of my um, head is a mandatory um, collection process. So. Um, Applicators will have to go out and identify deceased rodents and collect them and bring them back so that they can't be picked up by raptors. They'll also have to um, regularly check the um, distribution centers, so those uh, black boxes that we see, they'll have to be kind of serviced more frequently. Um, there's not a clear timeline on when EPA will announce its final recommendation, but I think the estimated um, date of announcement is sometime in 2026. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that Councillor Durkin has joined us. Um, thank you for, for attending. Um, this time, I'd like to give the opportunity to Councillor Weber. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that I live in Jamaica Plain. I also lived on Cranston Street. Uh, so I, a little bit more about the specifics of what, what you're uh, doing there. Is it uh, along multiple locations along the street just where you know, where it meets Sheridan or... Um. Yeah, so Cranston is kind of like an E-shaped street that's bordered by Sheridan, right? Um, and from my count, there's about 50 individual houses on in that area. Because of the feeding range of a rat, not every house must participate in the study in order to reap the benefits of the application because they overlap with the feeding range of a, of a mouse and a rat. Um, of those homes, 31 have participated in this study, and I have stations with the feed available um, at different points on the property. Some are by their trash can, some are in their backyard along fence lines, um, some are right at street level. Okay, and then how much in terms of like material are you dropping off and how often? I I'll make, show you. Yeah. Okay, so we use these measuring containers that have a measuring stick inside so that somebody that comes quickly by can just glance in and see what we're looking at. Um, I take a quick measurement of what's left and notice if there's anything um, unusual, whether there might be some track marks or droppings. I fill it back to 100%, give it a shake to make sure that it's level. I close the box and I move on. And do you, do you know about, it? so do you have like a weight or yeah, something? Yeah, 600 grams. Six, that, when that is 600 grams? Mm -hmm. At 100% fill, yes. Like if you went over a course of a month, you know how much food, you know, the birth control food you need? Yeah, I use, like I said, a heavy application just because we want to really keep our foot on the gas pedal when 
when learning how much is going to be needed. Um, I use about, I would say about 1,200 grams a month per station to be two full fills. Um, but as I mentioned, that's probably an overestimate of required amount. Um, and then I guess, so when we had our hearing um, with uh, an expert, uh, for the guy from New York, I can't remember his name, uh, uh, he talked about birth control having limited ability to lower the population because you could you could lower the number of births on Cranston, but if on Sher you know Sheridan or uh, Boylston right around the corner or Paul Gore, I guess uh, you know the rats are procreating like they usually do. They'll just come into that area. I, I mean, do you have? I, I know you. Um, I guess two parts, like, do you have a response to that? And, and two, do you, is, could you do a pilot in a place that's more enclosed uh, where you could maybe have, like, sh show the effectiveness? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question in two parts. Um, as far as whether we can show in a more enclosed location, yes, we've had a lot of success in an animal sanctuary in Utah where buildings have gone through extensive exclusion measures to make sure rodents aren't coming in or out. This mimics an island setting. In that situation where we knew that we were dealing with the same rodents, not new ones migrating in, we were able to bring the population down by 98% within four months, and it stayed down. Um, however, humans live differently than island settings, and rats live how humans live. So we have to figure out how to use an open border and still apply the same tactics. We are going to be able to see there will be in-migration in an open street setting, just because rats don't observe perimeters, boundaries, yard lines, property lines, things like that. But the more rodents that have access to birth control, the fewer births across the board. So the 50, 50 to 60 percent reduction we're demonstrating on Cranston takes into account in-migration and new rats showing up and becoming contraceptive, contracepted in the process. Okay, thank you. I, I have one last, maybe quick question. Um, I, I remember hearing about um, to reduce mosquito populations, a, a proposal to basically genetically modify them to be sterile. I don't know if what the whether that's even possible here or what the ethics of it are. If any anybody on the panel has, knows anything, I might. It was on the radio, so it was a reliable source. But, so uh, genetically modifying um, mosquitoes is technically more straightforward than genetically modifying a rat population. So I think that's more within reach than um, trying to do so with rats. I know there are studies in gene drives um, that look to see this possibility, but I think they're still 10 to 15 years out from application. Okay, thank you. Th thanks, Chair, for indulging me. Thank you, Councillor. I uh, just want to recognize that we've been joined by Councillor Flynn as well. Thank you for joining. Um, Councillor Braden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you mentioned um, that uh, in the rehabilitation center that you had a, um, an owl, that's, uh, a young owl that survived, and, and in its rehabilitation time, it, it ate, what, 2,000 rats? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I really I understand that that, that our, our predators are the key to controlling our, our rat population going forward. Like I remember walking in Quint Ave in, in Alston probably 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and it was uh, walking down the street and up on a ledge there was a whole family of red-tailed hawks, um, healthy, wonderful, beautiful animals. Um, but we don't see that so much anymore. Uh, I think I'm concerned, and also tell me about the uh, the safety of the the anti um, the the, the um, contraceptive. Like, does it if if rats eat a lot, if 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 other animals eat a lot of the uh, rats, do they? Does it affect their fertility? It doesn't affect their fertility. It does affect their nutrition. Um, because of the plant, because of the nature of being a plant derivative and all natural ingredients, it doesn't bioaccumulate in the liver or tissues of the intended target. Um, the half-life of our active ingredient in a rat is about 12 minutes in the liver, meaning it's metabolized more quickly than 
it would be able to have an effect on something that ate it. Even if, if a predator ate the rat within that 12 minutes, the formulation of our pellets has such an exquisitely low concentration of the active ingredient, it would not transfer to a secondary exposure. Because that's an important consideration. Yes. <laughs> um, and then just thinking about um, scaling this up, uh, you don't, as you said, you're not you're not doing a hundred percent coverage of of the, the houses in the study area. How do you how do you think about scaling it up to a larger area? Like we probably need to do this citywide. Uh, um, what, how would we do that? Well, I, I would want to work really closely with the city to find and identify areas where it's most badly needed first. Um, I think that a goal of complete coverage is a good place to aim, but even a, a smaller study or a smaller application at first would be an important step. Um, we understand the science and the behavior of the rodent. You understand the the density, the population of the city. So together we could identify ways to apply it more liberally and widespread without it becoming burdensome to, to the city. One issue we have in, in, in our particular neighborhood is we have a lot of absentee landlords. Do you need a landlord's permission to be at, um, to use the, you know, if, if they're absentee landlords, that, that's a big part of our problem is that yeah. trash disposal is not, I, not done well when you have absentee landlords. So. Um, do you, what's the relationship, how do you work with landlords? Because of where I've been working in Boston, all being private properties, I have had to have the permission of each individual property owner. When you move into city managed properties, we then just have to have the permission of the city. Um, so even if we couldn't do it ubiquitously across residential areas, starting with city held properties is a, is a good first step. We're working with the city of Chicago and they've identified their alleyways as a place where it wouldn't interfere with needing property permissions, but still able to have widespread um, distribution throughout city. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the rodents feeding range, what, is that about 300 feet or is it? Yeah, um, I, ideally when they're happy, when they have their needs being met, it's about 100 feet. They can be pushed up to 300 feet in a feeding range if there's scarcity of, of availability of food. But they prefer to eat pretty close to where they live. Close to home. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I really appreciate this filing. I appreciate uh, the conversation. Um, also really appreciate that the admin is here waiting to testify because I'm digging myself into the, the BRAP plan and really appreciate um, everything that the city is doing to try to mitigate rats, um, you know, looking at the complaint data within the Boston Rodent Action Plan. It's clear that every single neighborhood suffers from uh, rodent populations increasing. Um, I appreciate um, too uh, all of your testimonies. Um, I I think I've been alerted to an issue about um, about sort of the humane side of of this, and I appreciate um, your feedback. But respectfully, definitely, my constituents are asking for what is the most effective way to get rid. Um, and I know um, to get rid of the rodent population, and I know that having been on a couple of ISD walkarounds in my neighborhoods, some of these tools are already being used, and they are just aren't panning out to be uh, effective at like lowering the population at a significant rate. So I guess what is your response to that? Well, my response is that there's two ways to knock it down, right? There's quick, and then there's long term. Um, you'll notice in the, the BRAP report, it, it says that with a lethal knockdown strategy, you can expect a rebound within four months. So that puts you in a cycle of having to use the same tools over and over again. If instead you're looking at a more sustainable approach that doesn't happen immediately, but looks to curb the problem of a growing population, you're going to have a longer, more sustainable solution. 
Um, I'd also say that some of those non-poisonous but, but lethal measures can be used very effectively for an immediate knockdown strategy, but the problem you run into is, say you're gassing a borough, say you're using snap traps, you're never going to get every individual within that population, and the, the individuals that remain are going to continue breeding at that rapid rate, and that's what contributes to the, the quick rebound. And I guess... Um, what I've witnessed on these walk-arounds is that the city is using contrapest and they are using these tools alongside other tools. Um, I think it. I think what's difficult um, to evaluate is really how effective, um, and it, it's difficult for the city to measure just how effective this particular tool is over the other tools. Um, and I personally, I feel like for all of our business districts, um, figuring out how to um, create mitigation strategies for each one, which I know is something, and you know, public awareness campaigns are something that we need. But um, I do think um, having done a filing this year on containerization, uh, that is core to the direction that I think the city needs to go in. It's very difficult for the neighborhoods I represent, given that there's no space for trash cans. So. Um, but, I mean, I have been Googling late at night um, collapsible trash cans, so excited to talk with the administration panel about what they're thinking about with, uh, with other solutions. But um, in terms of uh, the overall strategy and trying to sort of dig in um, to, like, what percentage of a strategy do you think that rat birth control should be to our overall strategy as a city? That's a great question. Um, first, I want to clarify and just make sure we're, we're not advocating the use of contrapest. I think it comes with its own set of setbacks and um, has not been proven successful. We strictly recommend using good bites, which are a solid pellet, which withstand the application in a much stronger way. Um, as far as how much of the integrated pest management strategy it would need to be, we haven't yet measured. I think that um, that we would need the the input of city, like inspectional services and other, you know, um, trash management, waste management. It would be an important part of the IPM, but it wouldn't be the it wouldn't replace everything else. Do you think if, you know, I think a big part of the BRAP was figuring out, you know, different populations and one of the test cases in the BRAP is public housing. Do you think if the, so, some of these tools were utilized in a smaller sense, um, in, in sort of a smaller footprint, that that would be effective? Or do you feel like, because I, I, I think w what I'm grappling with just sort of hearing the information and trying to digest it is we have a whole city to run, and it just trying to do that, um, trying to scale, do this at scale, um, is difficult. And I know um, folks are working really hard. Um, and I, I, I guess on my end, I just, I'm not. Um, I, I know this, the tools that the city is already using, um, and I know the vendors that are already in place in some of our neighborhoods. Um, but I'm just curious, sort of, how do you, how do you sort of start using some of these tools without, um, which I, I know similar tools are being used, but like, how do you scale it up? Yeah, I, I think that your question about whether a smaller footprint would be effective um, is an important one. I think when you're talking about like a city housing project, for example, like you just mentioned. Um, what we have seen and has shown some promise is that using a food source that the rats trust, we have been able to relocate rats from inside buildings to outside. When you're talking about a very closely and densely populated public housing, um, one of the main concerns is the age and construction of the building itself. If you are able to use a tool that entices the rats away from the homes that they are currently inflicting, you're going to see a lot of success in that way. Um, and yes, we, we can demonstrate success in a small, smaller footprint. It doesn't require an all-in method for this to be picked up and considered successful. Any measure is a step in the right direction. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Councillor Flynn.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for being here. I had the opportunity to work on this issue for seven years on, on the City Council and have held many hearings on all issues relating to pest control. Recently, we had a consultant that also submitted a report to the City of Boston. Um, some of those were implemented um, that, I, that I previously recommended. Um, also, the, the one issue that hasn't been implemented was the um, uh, pest controls are uh, still, still an important piece of the, um, of the solution. What I wanted to focus on is, and, and one other issue I, I wanted to highlight too is Boston doesn't, up until recently, we haven't had any pest control specialists that were working on the weekends. They were all working um, Monday through Friday and then not, fr and not from Friday afternoon until Monday morning when significant quality of life issues do arise. Um, but getting back to, getting back to this issue, um, what success have you had working with other cities or towns um, across the country and can you describe what you did and what the success was or any challenge, challenges you had as well? Yeah, um, well every pilot program we've had has been an incredible learning opportunity. They've all been in very distinct and unique environments which all contribute to the to the building of best practices for application. I personally have only overseen the work um, in Boston and the East Coast. We've worked in New York, we've worked in uh, Marco Island, Florida. I'm establishing um, application with cities uh, in Connecticut and Chicago as well. Um, what changes from site to site isn't the behavior of the animal so much as the behavior of the people that live there. Um, there's a lot of education that goes into teaching people about containerizing their garbage, teaching them about picking up after their pet waste in their yard, and how these are all food sources for the rats in it and contribute to growing populations. Um, other than that, weather patterns and seasonality come into play, but if your question is whether or not you have to put this out on the weekends, you don't. It, a weekly application is more than enough. Thank you. From your experience, how important is public communication, ensuring the public knows exactly what, um, what is expected of them, what's expected of the city, the communication aspect of it, including um, communicating in various languages as well? Have you experienced um, working with diverse communities like that? I personally haven't experienced any language barriers yet, but that's probably just due to my areas of work. Um, I do think that civic communication is the most important tool. And as residents learn the work that you're doing, they understand it a little bit better and are able to talk about it amongst their peers, their neighbors. Rats are a very touchy subject. Whether you like them, whether you hate them, they can be incredibly polarizing. Um, Understanding that there is more than one way to address a problem goes a long way into solving it. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for the work you're doing. And um, I'm still advocating for a, 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 a pest control rat czar in the city of Boston. I think it's critically needed and want to ask my council colleagues um, for their support on that if we're serious about this issue. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Set the time for myself. Um, it's on. All right. Again, thank you. Um, I want to start with a question for Elena. You mentioned that other municipalities in the country have started to do some pilots. You said the city of Chicago is doing them in city owned alleys. And I know that one of my colleagues in public service, Councilor Sean Obreo in New York, um, was the one that introduced the legislation over there. Um, have they shown any success, um, especially that like Chicago's already doing it? What, what, how are the populations of rats decreasing? What's happening? To be clear, Chicago hasn't started yet. Okay. This is all in design. Okay. Um, it's kind of a snowball effect. As one city hears of it, then another one's like, we want to jump in, we want to try. So we're at various stages. Boston is by far the furthest along as, as urban deployment comes. Um, 
We have seen the success in Marco Island of implement, implementing at a city level, working with the um, city staff in this city in Florida. We were able to identify, um, we were able to fund, and we have able, been able to start our first city-owned property project. Okay. And I was reading recently a National Geographic report about how a pair of rats can have up to 15,000 mice a year. I don't know if that number is um, I don't know what the number is, but how That's would you imagine by using this kind of um, rat birth control decrease those numbers? Are there any estimates that have any studies that have been done on that? Well, within the first week of consuming good bites, male and female rodents are rendered infertile. So within the first 28 days, you're already skipping generations of 10 to 12 pups that will then go on to reach sexual maturity within the first six weeks of their lives. The numbers, the same way they exponentially grow, they exponentially decrease. Okay. Um, and I think to Councillor Fitzgerald's point, I, this, in regards to the ecosystem, that, 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 is, that is enough concern to, to, to you all? The ecosystem's of a high concern. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Sorry, um, in terms of decrease in the population um, like that, that, does it balance out well? It will absolutely. Nature wants to live in balance. Um, we, will, we do not anticipate any sort of population reduction that will leave a food shortage for natural predators. We want fewer rats, we want healthier rats. When there are fewer rats, you have less damage, you have less food insecurity, you have less disease burden, you have a stronger immune capability of those animals. And at that point, you're protecting the birds of prey because you're providing a healthy meal. You no longer have to worry about regulating whether pest managers have to come back and collect carcasses because you're no longer worried about leaving poisoned carcasses on the street. Okay. Thank you. Um, Zach, in your statement, you mentioned that there are other immediate solutions that you think could also um, go hand in hand with this um, that are not poisonous. What are, what are some that you recommend? Sure. So whenever we talk about rodent control, um, it's, a, it's a toolbox. and you want to use everything you can. Um, I think public education is probably the sharpest point in the toolbox. Um, getting out the word that you have a choice in the road of control you use in your own house. Getting out the word that you can be a part of the solution very easily. Um, some of the things we always recommend are the, the manual traps, meaning one run right at a time, snap traps, things like that, in conjunction with methods like the road and birth control, uh, as well as uh, better containers, uh, storing the containers in a um, sensible part of the yard that may have less access uh, to fence lines and things like that. Um, but that is generally what we try to tell people. And then another big one that hasn't been mentioned that we come up against a lot is feeding pets outside. And so limiting, um, you know, feeding your, your own animals and things inside and eliminating food sources. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's my time. Yes. But I do want to give, I want to ask my colleagues, does anyone have any follow-up questions for this specific panel? Yes? We got one more. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank everyone for the answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to have another question for Elena and want to shout out uh, Dr. Mayer for all the work that she's done. She sat down with our RACU in my office, Emily Poston, to really go over the data that uh, in JP and to think about what success looks like and measurability and all of that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the transition that Councilor Durkin had mentioned it as well from contrapast to good works? Yeah, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Dyer, who are the two founders of Wisdom Good Works, were the original inventors of the EPA registered contrapest. Um, it is a liquid form um, contraceptive that has known chemicals in it that required registration by the EPA. Since departing their work with Senestec and no longer working with contrapest, they've developed what they consider to be a more efficacious application. They are absolutely set that any, any product doesn't need to have chemicals in it when there are available plant derivatives that have the same effect. Um, we know that because it's a solid pellet form, the size of something a rat would eat, they're able to consume at the station. They're also able to safely take it back to the nest and feed their young. Mm -hmm. The sooner and younger a rat is when first exposed, the more quickly and longer lasting the contraceptive effect has. 
Thank you. And then this one, Good Works, Good, good Bites, isn't yet registered with the EPA? Is that something that we're, you're looking it, to do? or It's not going to require EPA registration. Under the FIFRA Act Section 25B, there are no ingredients in Good Bites that would cross that threshold of minimum risk requiring registration by the EPA. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask that question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a question about... Um, absolutely. I have one more question. I know we talked about raptors. Um, turkey vultures do eat carrion, like, um, and I had the, I saw one <laughs> I thought a few years ago. Um, so they eat some pretty, I would say, nasty stuff. Um, are they vulnerable, to, just like other um, animals, to the um, anticoagulants? They are. They are. Any of our uh, scavengers, and I'm glad you bring up the point, things like turkey vultures, but also a lot of the animals you don't hear about, um, things like crows. Uh, I know for this last week in our hospital, we took in three chipmunks that had all been exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides as well, um, possums, anything that would make a meal out of a rat, whether it's pre or post-mortem, um, is vulnerable. And the other animal that I've noticed disappearing from the neighborhood is uh, skunks. To is that a, 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 does that have any correlation with uh, the increase use of anticoagulants? You know, I'm not sure I know enough to speak on the population level, but I do know that skunks are are vulnerable as well. Um, and we've we've seen a case or two in skunks over the years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Not that anyone seems to miss the skunks these yeah. days, but um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Councillor. Um, anyone else? Well, I just want to take the time to thank you all again for, for coming in and testifying. I think that everything that we heard from you was very helpful, um, and it definitely educated me a lot about this um, topic. But I would like to invite you to stay, listen to the city panelists. Um, but yes, um, again, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we begin with the city panelists, I do know that one of the um, public testimonies do have to leave early. So I'm going to ask, can we do, um, we're going to do public testimonies now. So if you're here for a public testimony, um, please come down to the mic over here or to your left. Um, and you will have two minutes to provide your public testimony. Starting with Lauren and then Allison and Stephen. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I was told three minutes, so I will try to go quickly, but uh, not sure about two. Um, thank you, Councillor Luigian and Councillor Pepin, for all of your work, and to the other city councillors who are here. I appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Lauren O'Keen. I live on Cranston Street in Jamaica Plain. Um, Can you speak about, up just a bit? Yep. About seven years ago, in our neighborhood, the rat population burgeoned, including in my yard. We noticed that we had a burrow. We also started noticing more and more of those ubiquitous black uh, bait stations, poison stations all over. I learned many of the things that were mentioned by the very informative panelists. Um, I learned how ineffective the poison is and how when it does kill rats, they suffer bleeding internally for days and that they are animals who are successful. Well, I know they are successful because they're resilient, intelligent, fiercely dedicated parents um, and more. Um, but I started to dig deeper and learn that the poison bioaccumulates, and so there's all these hawks and owls and eagles who are also dying, as we've heard all about. And I learned um, that as, even though fear of disease is kind of the most frequent uh, 
reason people give for being freaked out and, and fearful of rats. Um, there is this study that I think one of the veterinarians mentioned um, that was peer reviewed in Chicago and showed that rats who are exposed to these poisons are far more likely to carry disease than the rats who have not been exposed to poisons. Um, so we drastically changed how we did things in our yard and we started using snap traps to try to provide a quick death for rats. To do this without killing cats and squirrels meant going out after dark to set traps and going out before light in the morning to, to take them back in and deal with the dead rats. And it was pretty awful. I killed about 30 rats and learned that every, for every female rat, when you count up all her babies and grandbabies, she could uh, lead to 1,000 more rats in a year. So those 30 are not that consequential. Um, we use dry ice in the borough. It really helps. We've done it many, many times. I researched alternatives and spoke with a sales rep from Contrapest, um, who had been, which system had been mentioned before. Um, we organ I organized neighbors and raised money from neighbors. And for about a year, we used Contrapest at many households on Sheridan and Cranston. It really didn't work that well due to the fact that it gets gross in heat and in cold and pretty ineffective in those half the year times. Um, like Elena alluded to. Um, but then I was in conversation with Dr. Mayer, and she suggested that we try her new fertility control project and now a product. And now for over a year, we've been, as you heard, the residential pilot study for Wisdom Good Works, and it has been a huge gift for our neighborhood, a, huge, a hugely beneficial opportunity. In the beginning, as we, was told, we were told was likely, there were slightly more rats around, um, as Elena noted. But after six months in my yard, we no longer saw or heard rats at night, which had been kind of a constant, not that pleasant when you're out on the patio at night. Um, and after eight months, the holes and all the other signs of a burrow in my yard disappeared, and they're gone. Um, and the data, as Elena spoke to, is even more impressive. We had an 80% decrease from the baseline in, around my house and a 70% decrease from the baseline overall. So it's a community effort that's been very, very effective. Um, it is uh, fertility control works in the right ways, unlike the poison that works in all the wrong ways. Um, it's, I, I, blah, blah, blah. I suggest, sorry, I'm forgetting where I was. Um, yeah, it, I suggest, like Sam Anderson from Audubon talked about, starting with the use of Wisdom Good Bites, or starting with fertility control, specifically Wisdom Good Bites, in areas that are large and under city control. Um, so like City Hall Plaza, for example, um, the Common, other large parks, public housing developments, starting partnerships with colleges, perhaps also working in neighborhoods that have really organized, effective local civic organizations who could be partners in the maintenance efforts and rallying volunteers. Um, now is really the time for this opportunity for the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Allison? Hi, uh, my name is Allison Blank. I live in Brighton. I also am director of advocacy for the Animal Rescue League of Boston, so I'm wearing two hats today. Um, so I first would like to thank uh, Councillor Pepin for filing this, um, City Council President Lejeune and the other members of the City Council for holding this hearing today. This is something that is an issue across Boston and obviously in Brighton. Um, I get a, a rat walk every time I walk home from the tea at night. So I appreciate that many of you have gone out into the communities to see um, what the uh, issues people are facing as the city of Boston is working on its plans to have um, rodent control, having humane options is incredibly important. Um, my neighbors and those around me are changing their behavior because they want to make sure that their animals are not ingesting um, animals that have come in contact with these escars. It's dangerous to have this wildlife that oftentimes, um, as some have said, that you'll find a um, injured uh, rat or other animals, um, raptors, that um, then we have to call 311 because people are concerned about their pets, um, particularly in the neighborhoods. Um, so as uh, the Boston City Council works to look for um, some non-lethal options, this is something that is incredibly important. Um, I would also like to uh, mention something that one of the other panelists um, said earlier about glue traps and would really urge the city to move away from using these. These are incredibly inhumane, cause an incredibly painful death for these animals and quite frankly are not very effective. Um, 
As just a personal note too, I will say that I once lived in a rodent infested apartment that had a very attentive landlord, but unfortunately the methods that are used are just not effective and we really need to be using, as others have said, all the tools in the toolbox to make sure that we are effectively dealing with the problems of constituents and of the animals in Boston. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good time. Um, Stephen? I am Stephen Ronan from Roxbury. Um, I wanted really just to thank you for putting this forward and seriously considering it. You know, I think it's an important initiative. I submitted a few pages of testimony, but it overlaps with what's been said better before. Um, I do want to commend the last person um, for bringing up the subject of glue traps. I know Bobby Corrigan has advised here. I know he's written that one of the problems with them is they tend to get the younger juveniles while the breeding adults stay breeding. Um, and they're just horribly, horribly cruel. Um, so anyway, thank you for your time and your work on this. Thank you, sir. Okay. This time we will move forward with listening by um, the city administration. Thank you so much for being here as panelists. Um, it's so good to see familiar faces here. Um, would allow, you guys would like to do some intros and opening statements? Yes, good morning. I'll start. Um, Dion, our Chief of Operations. So thank you, Chairman Pepin, Council President Lu Jen, and all members of the City Council. Um, thank you all for the work that you have been doing on this issue and so many other issues that um, have a deep impact on the quality of life in the city. This is a topic that's very important for the mayor. That's why the, the mayor helped, uh, wanted us to form this um, Boston Road and Action Plan working group. If we brought every member of the working group here, we would not be able to fit on. There are not enough seats here because there are so many departments that are so fully engaged on this particular topic right now. Our co-chair, um, Ryan Woods, the head of the Parks and Recreation Department, he's not here with us today, but he's watching live. And our other members, the, the Water and Sewer Commission, the Housing Authority, the Public Works Department, I can go on and on, but it's, it's important to note that this is an all hands on deck um, type of issue because although rats love big cities, the feeling is not mutual. <laughs> and a part of that is, is also for us to really look at all the tools, make sure that we're working in collaboration. Public education has been mentioned before is important. Um, and, and that's why I also want to commend the, the previous um, panel and also the folks who gave public testimony because it's so important that, that we recognize that this is uh, all, all hands on deck type of thing. This is not just a city solution, it's a community solution and we need to take all of the, the tools and innovations that are available because we certainly don't believe that we can poison our way out of this problem. We need to be working on it from all fronts and including containerization and looking at uh, innovative methods that are, that are being employed. Um, we are certainly looking at this among other tools and you know, at, at this point we are still evaluating and looking for more information. Some of the cities that have been mentioned who are uh, currently using um, contraceptive, we've, we've been talking to them, we've been gathering information so we're certainly open to, to all, all of the uh, things that could be successful in this endeavor. So I'm going to stop here and turn it over to a Commissioner of Inspection of Services, Tanya Del Rio. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tanya Del Rio. I'm Commissioner at the Inspectional Services Department, City of Boston. And uh, like the Chief did, I also want to thank the previous panel and the Council for putting this together. Uh, this is a method that we are monitoring and looking at very closely as the science behind it develops. So for us, getting, getting a sense of what the experience on the ground has been in Jamaica Plain, um, in, in having the, the residents of the city be aware of that too is, is very important. And again, this is something we're closely watching. Um, I do want John to discuss the more technical and like really get into the weeds of this, but I did want to just from the outset name that ISD has already phased out the use of the anticoagulant rodenticides with the minor exception of sewer baiting um, because there are no approved products for sewer usage. Um, the city program covers public spaces. We, we do want to talk about also how to work with 
in conjunction with all the private property owners, where, which is where we see the bulk of the anticoagulant uh, rodenticide usage in the city. Um, I wanted to also share just the four basic principles of the Boston Road and Action Plan group. We do want to work on prevention, education, coordination, and intervention. Um, as far as prevention, it's been talked about, but I want to emphasize it again. Public education and human behavior modification is how we are going to control the population. Having better waste management practices, changing our, the way we behave, as the previous panel said, is going to have the highest ROI, simply said. Um, so we are behind that 100%. Coordination, it's been talked about too. The conversation among city departments, the conversation among cities that are battling the same, address, uh, the same issue, and also the coordination between the public sector and all of our residents and members of the public uh, to, to get us together to change that human behavior. And then lastly, intervention. I, I'll let, leave, you, leave you to lead the, the conversation on all of those kind of technical what are the best methods and which tools, I hate this metaphor, but which tools in the toolbox should we actually be using more or which levers should we pull? So I am excited to be a part of the conversation, to remain a part of the conversation. And with that, I'll introduce my colleague, uh, John Ulrich, our Assistant Commissioner for the Environmental Services Division and co-chair of the Boston Road and Action Plan Working Group, a mouthful. Thank you, Commissioner. John Ulrich, I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Environmental Services. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Thank you for the Council uh, for your continued partnership on this issue. Um, my division, uh, we have 14 licensed inspectors uh, who are licensed to do pest control. We cover 22 wards across the city. We do pest control in public parks, public sewers, and public ways. Uh, in June, <clears throat> Mayor Wu launched the Boston Road and Action Plan, which was a coordination of city departments. Um, we have looked at all of our operations, um, how each department is affecting rodent population, um, identifying the, the challenges mainly around sanitation and waste, um, and what control methods we can use that are, are most effective. As the commissioner said, we have phased out second generation anticoagulants um, except in sore baiting. So currently, uh, once the road and action plan came out, the recommendation, which was a strong recommendation, was to not use second generation anticoagulants. Um, we immediately removed them from our trucks um, and the majority of the surface baiting and treatment that we use is carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide is a, um, a machine called the Burrow RX. Has a hose, pumps carbon monoxide into the burrows, um, asphyxiates the, the rodent in the burrow. No, no chance of secondary poisoning. Um, the second is a tanked uh, carbon dioxide, similar to uh, you know dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide. Um, Dry ice has always uh, been a challenge since they, they labeled that product, and so this was the solution. Um, so similar to the Borough RX, we use carbon dioxide uh, pumping in to the borough um, and uh, kills the rodent in the borough, no chance of secondary poisoning. The carbon dioxide allows us to be closer to a structure, an occupied structure. So carbon monoxide, there is a 10-foot limit from an occupied structure carbon dioxide, you can use it right up to the building. So then we have full coverage um, with those two methods where we don't need to use rodenticide. Um, we also do night trapping um, in areas of, um, of heavy activity, um, especially in parks. And um, communication with the public education, uh, I know that uh, there was a question about language. We, all of our educational material is in uh, six languages and uh, I think we're moving to 11 languages. Um, so we, we don't often, we, we, I think we have pretty good coverage uh, as far as language access and uh, with our um, constituent service team to make sure we have access and we're communicating uh, with the public. Since June, we have conducted 30 plus neighborhood walkthroughs uh, to identify issues, allow neighbors to point to challenges, 
um, and address them right on site. Our main function is the enforcement of the state sanitary code. So the majority of our work is going out, uh, identifying violations of the sanitary code and writing a violation. What that looks like is we write the violation, it's served by a constable um, from the date of service. They have seven days to correct that violation, the property owner. Um, if that does not happen, they are sent to an administrative hearing um, and then it's forwarded to housing court. So that covers anything from rodent activity to improper storage of trash and just general sanitation issues. Um, so with that uh, and the coordination with the, the Boston Road and Action Plan, um, I am pretty excited to, um, to move forward in, in the coordination. I also um, met with uh, the Good Works team, uh, a great team. I, I met with them at the beginning of that, of that project and got to spend some time with Dr. Meyer. Um, very interesting stuff um, and uh, reviewed the data, went on walkthroughs with Alina. Uh, a couple times, and um, whatever tools work to reduce rodent population, um, I'm interested in, uh, especially if, if they uh, reduce the risk of harm to, to wildlife. So um, I appreciate the, the formal panel. I appreciate the partnership of the council. Um, it's good to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much to the three of you um, for that. And again, thank you so much for the work that you all do. I've, Throughout my tenure here at City Council, nothing but great experience working with you all. Thank you so thank you for coming up to my district and taking care of all the residents that have reached out to us. Um, this time, we'd like to go to questions from my colleagues, starting with co-sponsor, Madam President Louis Jen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the administration for being here, John. Uh, you're great in all the work that you do. Thank you for being open to whatever strategies work um, and for all you do, all things rat. Um, in the city of Boston. Um, question regarding the pilot in JP, and you said you went on rat walks, and that you've gone, you went over the data with Dr. Mayer. Is there, is there something that you would want to see in the data to be encouraged that this is a pilot that should be expanded and that we should be further implementing throughout the city? So the data basically is based on consumption um, and in the walks and conversation with some of the other neighbors, there was concern that they actually saw an increase in activity. So more evidence that, the, uh, that it, there's actual reduction in, in population. I know that there were a couple of community gardens that, that used it um, that didn't have success. I think the challenge is uh, open populations and how do we, how do we deal with that? I think Dr. Meyer can, can prove that her product works, right? But how do we use it in a city with an open population in a neighborhood like JP or a neighborhood like Brighton? Um, what is the best strategy um, and what other tools that can we use with that product to make sure it's successful? So. Thank you. And if I may um, add, yes. is that okay? Commissioner. Uh, yeah, um, we also went ahead and checked for, as John said, it's very difficult to measure the baseline population of the area because you don't know where the rodents are, it's how to, you know, you can't conduct a simple census. Mm -hmm. um, interesting to hear about the camera method for, for tracking them, we want to mm -hmm. learn a little more. Um, however, we are best proxy right now, we are working on better data models with a couple of statisticians, but our best proxy at the moment for this data is 311 complaints. We did go ahead and look at them at the neighborhood level in JP and at the precinct level in the places yeah. where, where this pilot was conducted. And unfortunately, we didn't see a downward trend. So last year in 2023, we did have a total of 82 complaints from the area at versus 2024 where we had 154, so it's almost double. And at the precinct level, even though the N is very small, I think it's like five to 10 complaints, um, we also saw an upward trend. So again, not a perfect proxy, but the best we have is not showing a downward trend at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, I um, wanna ask about, about something that's not related, uh, and it's been touched on by some of my colleagues, I know Councilor Braden, led the effort on increasing fines on absentee landlords because we know that 
open dumpsters are basically a buffet for um, for rats and for rodents. Um, have we have we been doing? And John, you've always been good when we've had a code enforcement issue along with others with uh, uh, John Blackmore and others in in going after um, absolutely landlords. But have we seen like is a rat uh, coordinated response that you're a co-chair of? I've been doing work on the absentee landlord end of things, on open dumpsters, on uh, the things that are the biggest issues when we come when it comes to a multiplying rat population. I would say that the, the group is looking at all things trash, um, whether it's enforcement or containerization. Um, it is a main focus. Trash is our, our number one food source for rodents. Food is the main driver of rodent population in the city. So. No food, no rats, is what uh, Dr. Corrigan says. Um, yeah. And so finding ways, whether that, uh, you know, fines is a good way to motivate folks to, to change their behavior, it's human behavior, and how do we change that? So uh, the effort is in education, um, it's in trying to address some of the challenges in neighborhoods that they have, challenges around trash storage and how they put their trash out. Um, so all of those things are, are being looked at um, and, and worked on. Thank you. And then I just have one more question for this round. Um, other cities have been looking at, like, using dogs, dogs that are vaccinated against the disease that rats carry. Some of them are been doing are being led by the cities themselves. I think Chicago. I was at Georgetown Homes, and they were they were telling me about this um, in Hyde Park. And and then others, like I think it's D.C. It's like the citizens themselves, residents are taking, who own a certain breed of dog who are uh, going out to really fend against the rodent population. Just would love to hear your take on, on that. It's, it's uh, very effective um, in a small area. Like There's a company out of D.C., uh, it's called Mulvaney's company. I did uh, meet with him and go to Cambridge Public Works where they use them for where they store their trash trucks. Um, the dogs are, are very uh, effective at, at mitigating rodents, especially in a, in a certain area. So we had multiple city departments there that, that saw that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, treatment, and, um, and then we're, we're looking at if it, if it will work in, uh, in different areas of the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, let's see. Councilor Fitzgerald. And Council Murphy's next. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yes, it is Council Murphy. Council Murphy. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, a few questions, and I know um, public testimony. I forgot your name, but the woman from Brighton was saying how, you know, she lived in a rat-infested apartment, but she also had a very proactive landlord who was trying. So on like the three one one fines and the sanitary code. And I'm not saying in her case at all, but when I go out and walk my dog and I see that sometimes it's just individual residents who are choosing, and it's not just on trash day, maybe chicken bones, things are thrown out or left on the street. Are there fines we can give to individuals or does it always have to be tied to the homeowner in the house? So currently, uh, environmental services uh, violations, they're not fines. We, we don't have any fines attached to our violations um, there just a remedial fine asking for you to correct it. Code enforcement, I believe, have to issue to the property owner. Housing inspectors, I believe, have some ability to um, address tenants in the building. Okay. Um, but yeah, as far like as- What power does the landlord have if they have tenants, right, in that case, who aren't following, even though they're trying their best to make sure that, you know, they have the proper barrels, they store their trash properly, but... Yeah, they, they, they could re reach out to ISD Housing, um, uh, and they could help them with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, the pilot, it was said how they're using, you know, heavy application, oversaturated, so they're, maybe the data isn't showing they're getting great results, but how could we realistically see that go throughout the city and making sure that you know, equitably that all of our neighborhoods, if this is something or if any ideas we're having that we're not you know, picking and choosing neighborhoods that we're able to make sure that we could expand this, that do we have the bandwidth and what would the city need to do to make sure that this is something we could handle going forward? 
I, I think that we, we first have to just make sure that we're actually seeing it reduce rodent population, which I think that there is evidence that, mm -hmm. that it, it is effective, um, and making sure it works in an open population like a, a city. And then identifying areas to start that have the, the biggest challenge. I think we have to start somewhere mm -hmm. places where we have the biggest challenge. But we're concerned about every neighborhood in the city of Boston. I'm just thinking of other, um, you know, pot maybe started out as pilots like the speed humps because every neighborhood is going to say that they want them and that they all have speeding issues. But we start in certain areas and then as an at-large counselor, I definitely get those concerns and calls like, hey, how come it's happening there? How come it's not coming to my neighborhood? So I'm just thinking in this case too, where this is an example that if we were to decide it worked or we decided something else worked. And, I appreciate that we are starting in a small area to test it, but if it was to go citywide, how do we ensure that all of our neighborhoods are going to get the same amount of support? So I, I can answer that. The report, from the Boston Road, Action, Boston Road Action Plan report does advise us to start with the areas where we have the highest um, incidents of the problem, so we are starting with those hot spots, and those hot spots may move, so we try to start there and test out the different approaches with the intention always of going citywide and treating every neighborhood uh, the same way. Uh, we, are, we are thinking, again, that the waste management, the trying to get, especially the residential trash, containerized is going to be our highest ROI, but as we find new approaches like this one, we might start, or, or again, again, the advice we got is to start in the highest incidence areas and then expand if we find that they're effective. And are we basing that only on 311 calls? I know you have much more knowledge and very smart, dedicated team, but are we only basing that hot, the hot spots from that data? That I is the main data point. I can start, well, I can describe the work yeah. that MIT did. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so that's our current best information, plus some work that Dr. Cor um, Bobby Corrigan did when he was out, um, observational, using also our inspector's uh, experience to put together what um, he was calling the priority action neighborhoods. In addition, we worked with a group of MIT students that are helping us create a model that predicts um, where rad activity might be that we haven't picked up through 311 complaints, understanding that some of that, some neighborhoods have different behaviors around complaining in 311. So what they did is they created a bunch of like fake observations. So they said, okay, let's say there was a complaint here, even though we didn't get it, send inspectors out and see what sure. they see. And right now they're, I want to say in the middle of, or what Sec thing? We're in the second phase of collecting data. Uh, and validating it. And then feeding that data back into the, the model so that it improves, um, so that we can feel pretty confident about uh, the output. Yeah, so to simplify, the existing model made some predictions. They are like, here's a spot that, based on the conditions and the type of sewer that they have, and they, it fed it a lot of variables in, in addition to the complaints. Um, here's a spot where you might have rodents that you won't know about. We're sending inspectors out to see if the model is correct or not, to validate the model and improve it, and then move towards more of a proactive rather than reactive response. But we're in the middle of that work. It's not there yet. One last um, statement. Yep. Um, when you mentioned the increase of 311 calls in Jamaica Plain, have you thought through that maybe that's related to the increased education and the neighborhood being more invested and involved in kind of watching out for rats when they might not have otherwise been yes. really thinking about it? And anytime I go to neighborhood meetings, if it's about traffic, whatever the issue, and we're always encouraging people, I think we all do it, like call 311, like you just said, that is the city's number one way to track it. So that when we get people to call, then it kind of skews the data. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, and that's what that's what's behind my comments uh, to Councillor Luijen around calling it a proxy. It's a very imperfect proxy for the reasons yeah, you just no, outlined. You so yeah, yeah. right now it's the best we have. As we develop our predictive model, I think that'll be a better tool. We're just we're not done yet. So at the moment, it could be anything. It could be people have more education awareness, they're reporting and using the tool more. It could be 
complaints are lowered because they're working with their own private pest control, and it's very hard for yeah, us to know. Private yeah. pest control, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councilor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just did a route walk a couple weeks ago, and thank you to Brendan Sheehan, who accompanied us on that one. Um, and one thing that he had said that I kind of, it, I think it would help people if anyone's listening into this, right? Of like, some people just expect, hey, you guys have to come and solve my rat problem that I have, right? And I'm sure you guys got to deal. And he, he was explaining, like, it's more about educating the people, like to Council Murphy's point, about, about what's going on, what you're doing that's causing it. And like, we're not a service, we're not a free service that's a, a rat extermination service for you guys, which I think, it, it, unfairly so, in my mind, I was kind of like thinking, oh, that's what I would, that's what I would expect. But so, um, I think that's just a good distinction. I just wanted to, to clarify because when he said that, I, it kind of clicked. Um, but around this, it, you know, the birth control stuff, uh, the the cost, the manpower, is this something that would, would we have to get additional folks to implement this or is this something that can be taken on in-house currently? Or is this like, does a new department get created within ISD or the rat? Like, do we know how that looks yet? I I don't. Um, I, I would imagine that any addition uh, of a project this scale, um, we would need, um, you know, additional uh, help okay. from, from the current operation. Yeah. I can say, um, our folks, we, we had a conversation with the folks in, um, in D.C., um, Derek De Silva from my office um, spoke with them, and they talked about their program. I, I believe um, that the, the rough number that they had budgeted for a pilot was about 300,000. They sp spent about 25,000 and they discontinued the program just because they felt like they, it, it was very labor intensive and they didn't feel like they were seeing the results. Mm. Uh, that's just from our, our conversation with them, but we are still talking to other cities who are doing that's this. That's the same one, that's the birth control, so they, the birth th that's control. the birth control one. So yes. they thought they didn't see the results. So we, but we did hear from some panels today that we have, that here at least, right, so there's, I mean, I know that it's not an exact science, like you said, so there could be reports that it works, some reports that it's not, it's not the greatest, but just wondering about the initial, co uh, initial cost of this and sort of, um, you know, as we're looking forward to either ramp it up, what that might have to do in the budget next year. And things yeah, like I that. mean, th there's the cost of, of the, the program, and then there's also like the, there's some staff costs related. I think DC mentioned that they um, had to have staff go to each box like on a weekly basis to, to make sure that right. it was sufficiently um, supplied. Yeah, that's right, with the, with the collection portion of this doing, like it, it's hard enough and, and we're spread thin enough to have people go out and, and sort of do the work they're currently asked to do. I was just wondering what the burden was to be like, well now we also have to weekly collect the dead rodents and test them and uh, the, you know, the costs associated with that. So um, be happy to hear about that as we sort of, as you guys dig deeper, but uh, that's all on my end. Thank you for all you guys do and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Weber. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, your testimony. Um, I guess just uh, so it might, might, I'm correct that uh, birth control is not part of the uh, the, the rodent action plan. Is that correct? It was not included. Not at the moment. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't it's, included in the actual report. Okay. And is is that are you still looking in, into that? Yeah, so the, it's not among the recommendations that we received from the report. Um, not among, it's not among them. Um, what we are doing is, like I said, monitoring as the science developed. Uh, the cost involved, since the product is still in the research and development phase, um, we have been observing, monitoring it, because if it proves effective, if it proves like it's something we should definitely adopt, we want to do that. At the same time, we want to be good stewards of taxpayer money, and if it's still in that research and development phase, we don't want to be kind of the people experimenting on it if we've received mixed reports. So we're excited and interested in watching it. It's not a formal recommendation that we received, um, so that's that's kind of the stage we're at with it. Okay, and then I, maybe you addressed this er earlier, but so ha have you had any conversations with other cities about their approach to, to birth control and how they plan to utilize it yeah I mean you do yeah uh, like I just mentioned um, we did speak to Washington DC and they talked about their experience and they discontinued their their um, their pilot program 
I uh, believe we also are in communication with Dr. Corrigan helped us to um, evaluate the New York experience with it. So it, at this point, um, as he was stated, it's an open question. So it's still something that they're looking at. Um, I learned today at the hearing that Newton is um, on the list. So we're going to add them to the list of people to do outreach with. So we're, I don't know if there's anything else to add, John, or who else we've talked about this. Yeah, and, I, and I've sp spoken to Dr. Corrigan, who has spoken to uh, other cities, Seattle, D.C. I think New York has tried it a couple times, um, and the results are inconclusive. They're unsure. Um, okay, Ed, do you, know, do you have any recommendations for locations where we could try uh, a pilot that maybe... You, you would be interested we, in Yeah, I, I think I could work with uh, with the, the group of folks to, to identify areas where they thought it would it would be most effective to, to start. Okay. Uh, just to add a couple points. One, um, we did also send staff. You were sick, but staff right. uh, did attend the New York City Rat Summit to network with as many American cities as were there uh, to learn about those methods. None of the, I think none of the most salient uh, takeaways were around the, the the product. Um, what's your other question? Identify. Oh, just locations location. in Boston. All the locations. Yeah. yeah um, we did identify some neighborhoods as hot spots initially. So those include downtown, the, the Haymarket, North End, Boston Common area, um, some Bay, parts of Austin Dorchester, Bay. Roxbury, Back Bay, and Austin Bray. Okay. And then, again, I apologize if you addressed this already, but is there any progress in, um, you know, steel containers for, for neighborhood? I, any proposals? Uh, I know New York is uh, controversially, uh, you know, uh, suppose I think they're going to have, they're going to take up like a 100 plus thousand parking spots for uh, containers. Uh, any Anything on the horizon here? Uh, it, so we are looking at all things trash, as I said before. Uh, containerization uh, is a is a huge part of of uh, reducing rodent population. So we are we are currently looking at it, but there's no proposal. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Braden. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I had a question about the food composting program, the green buckets. Um, I was out on a rodent walk recently and somebody from city uh, worker was saying he was a bit skeptical about how effective that was and um, so what is, is there any, because the whole idea is to take food out of the, out of the trash cans and that, that's uh, and separated and composted, put it to good use but take food out of the trash cycle. Um, any, any feedback on how effective that is? and? I, I, I love doing my green bucket. I was discouraged to hear I, that it wasn't yes. making any impact. <laughs> I, I, I would disagree. I, I think that um, removing food waste from trash is a huge step in the right direction. I've also not seen any, had any reports of rodents getting into those green buckets. No gnawing or reports that it was causing rodent activity. So removing food waste from trash and then putting it in a good t container reduces the chance that it will become a food source for rodents and, and mm -hmm. you know, um, addressing the issue. Yeah. So. And I, I would add that the report does mention that expanding that program okay. would be quite helpful. And I think it's the right moment to invite residents to sign up because I saw, I saw that some spots might, might, be, might be available yeah. to sign up for that program. I love mine too. I think in Alston Bride, one of our big problems is that we have lots of buildings that are more than six units. So, um, and the other, the other, when I talk to, I think we need a policy that with new buildings, that we need to be more proactive in, in asking new buildings to uh, set up trash disposal um, and going away from, you know, open dumpsters and all that fun stuff. Um, and, and also food composting and new buildings it's something where, you know, they say there's no regulations, there's no requirements, so why would we do it? But I think, you know, taking really an, a proactive approach to all the new buildings that we're building. Um, and it really, you know, I think one of the bottom lines, like I'm, I'm really impressed with the numbers, like this, 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 this young owl that was in, in rehab, he had two, 
2,000 rats in, a few, in 12 months, that's a lot of rats. Um, I think my concern is that the city's doing the right thing, taking out the, anti the anticoagulants, the rodent rodenticides out of the um, uh, out of use, except for in sewers. But you know, every other homeowner, landlord, and and um, uh, pest control company is probably continuing to use those products that are detrimental, because we're we're actually killing the animals that are going to help us solve the problem. So. Um, is there any, do we have any impact on what private householders and landlords can do? I think the best way that we can impact right now is, is education. Um, letting folks know what those, the chemicals that the company uses. You can request to use alternative uh, rodenticide. There are alternatives out there, I know that um, that uh, the panel mentioned uh, a couple of them, but there is a vitamin D3 out there, um, which is uh, comes in a soft bait um, that isn't a second generation anticoagulant, um, and there were there were others in the in the report, um, so that we're not totally eliminating the tool of rodenticide, but the second generation anticoagulants, because of the impact on the environment, it was recommended in the report that that we should stop using them. Yeah. So education um, to folks getting that out there um, so that they make the request of their pest control contractor. Yeah. Well, there we go. Time up. Thank you. Is it my time? Um, Councilor Braden always finds a way to ignite more questions in my head, so I'm going <laughs> to follow up with a question about the compost program. Does the city have a program for um, restaurants to have compost in bins outside of their businesses? Because I know that some of the hot spots are obviously a lot of, there's a lot of restaurants and a lot of local businesses. Is there a current program like that at the moment? I don't. I don't. We'll have to get back to you. Yeah, we're not sure on it. Okay, okay. Maybe that's a good idea where it's, it's maybe it's a bigger bin or bin per restaurant to be able to comp compost their food and their leftovers. Um, Okay, some of the, Chief Irish, you mentioned that DC, when you spoke to them and your team spoke to them, they weren't, they said that it wasn't effective, but it's my understanding that they were using contrapest um, in comparison to what's, what was spoken about earlier today. Have you spoken to anyone that has used what was being proposed today, like the good bites, or would you be open to potentially uh, doing another study in the city of Boston? Because Mindset that they're different. Contra pass and good bites are, are two different things that perhaps will have different outcomes. Yeah, no, you are correct. DC um, used contra pass. John, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, have you talked to anyone who's using this particular product? I have not, except uh, observing the the, um, the pilot in JP. Yeah, and how for clear, how long was the pilot in JP going for? Is it still going? So I met with them at. Seven months, Elena. I think. Yeah, I started right outside. Yeah. Since last August. Since last August. Yeah. So I think it went on for uh, for twelve months. Twelve months. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I the way I I said view this is this is this isn't the solution, right? We can't just depend on this. This is a long-term solution. This is where we can balance out the population of rats in the city of Boston. So I feel like if we continue doing pilots and maybe a more of a hot spot of a neighborhood, maybe we can see more concrete numbers. Um, I, you were given the neighborhoods and JP wasn't one of them. So maybe if we go to the North End or to the Commons and downtown, we can have more effective numbers. So I'll be open to figuring out how can we could start another pilot um, in one of those areas with the colleagues that represent those districts. Um, one other question that I had for you, this is more of a numbers question. How much does the city spend on rat population control methods? So can you repeat the question? How much does, the, how does your department spend on rat, um, rat population control methods? That, that is a good question. I, I think John may be able to give you an answer on his program at ISD, but I think we need to do like a wider survey among the multiple departments who are also expending um, funds towards the same end. To just 
Yeah, yeah, so can, I, can I? Oh, yeah. uh, sorry, <laughs> we can give you the number, but I can tell you maybe more of the line items. It's John plus his staff. You're twenty something people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as Chief said, multiple departments, BPS, BHA, B water sewer, etc., are contributing to the effort. So we'd have to really do a survey and quantify. And as far as equipment, you're using bait, the Borough RX. Yeah, and it's, not it's that about much a nine. nine $10,000 per year for uh, equipment uh, supplies um, and, and a staff of 21. Um, but there's also um, 50 plus inspectors that deal with rodents. Uh, we have health inspectors that deal housing. with rodents in, in restaurants. We have housing inspectors that are doing inside uh, interior work uh, on home. So, um, so overall, what, what the cost to address rodent activity in the city is, is bigger than just my, my department. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking about how, how much an, a bigger pilot would cost um, then thinking about the future next year's budget to see what, how much we should be asking for. Maybe that's more further conversation with your department in regards to details. Um, I do have one more question, and this is more for the public in general, in case anyone's interested. I want to know if I'm, I'm a resident, right, and I see rats in my neighborhood around my house. And I reported the 311. What is the process that is taken um, by your department? What's from getting my 311 report to hopefully alleviating the issue? Sure. So um, when you put in your complaint to 311, it's filtered through the 311 system. It goes directly to the handheld of the area inspector. So we have 14 inspectors that cover 22 wards. Whoever that inspector is that's covering that area will get that complaint on his queue. Within 48 hours, he will respond. Um, the more detail you can be, the, the better. Sometimes we have anonymous complaints that say, I saw rats on my street. That can be challenging. So then we respond back with the direct contact information of the inspector and ask for more information. But within 48 hours, you'll get a response or an inspection. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know my time is up. Uh, I want to know, do any of my colleagues have follow-up questions for the city's administration? Okay. Well, just to, I think this is, uh, the others have mentioned this already, but we're, we're not, we're saying we'd like to see more data, and this is something that could work in conjunction with the other methods that we're already using, but because of the lack of, an, of a contained space, which we think is dependent, um, either being able to review the data or on efficacy, uh, it alone we're not like going to be charging for with it as like our rat mitigation strategy. Right, I, I think there's, there's a, a, a whole approach that we have to do to address rodent activity across the city and that's why we, we came up with the Boston Rodent Action Plan. But um, it, it could be a tool that we use in conjunction with, with the other stuff that we're doing. Right, and just like, well, as in most things you do, you know, well, maybe we don't have the strongest set of evidence that we'd like to see because it is by video population, but we do hear testimony from you know, the resident in Jamaica Plain and from some people that it's working. So I, I, I look at it as like, you know, how much will this cost the city? Is that cost worth us investing in to do continued pilots alongside everything else we're doing? I, I don't have that answer right now. I, I could work with Alina, look at yeah. look at the data, and and, and review it, and, and see if, if if it's doable. Okay, thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. I had question. <laughs> yeah, I had a, a question during the big dig. They had a you had a really coordinated approach to rodent control, um, and one of the issues was truly really increase the, the biological rodent control, like you introducing more red-tailed hawks. Um, and that seemed, do we have any, that seemed to be pretty effective, like that's uh, reducing the, the use of, they didn't use the use of poisons, but they are also the spin-off effect was that reduced our, our population of pigeons in the city as well, so. Um, any, any thoughts on, like I, I really feel that the biological controls are really important, but if we continue to use um, the, the, I'm not saying the city is not using them, but private homeowners, we continue to use these poisons that are killing our, our um, the predators that are killing the rats, then it's sort of a self-defeating cycle. 
So I, I don't know of the Red Tail Hawk program for the Big Dig. I know there was a, a rehab program where we started to see more Red Tail Hawks. Um, but I can reach out to Bruce Colvin, who was our rat guy. Um, I did speak with him a couple of weeks ago about his paper and the work he did during the Big Dig. Um, he's made himself available um, to review. We do use his documents. He really um, created urban uh, pest control um, during that time. Um, there was a, a lot of federal funding, and, and Bruce did a lot of work during the Big Dig on um, landscaping. So we're using his papers with the parks department and looking at how we design parks to make them less friendly and welcoming to uh, to rodents. So I can reach out to Bruce um, and talk about the red tail hogs. And the other question I had was a lot of people are advocating for the big belly uh, trash disposals and. You know, rats can get into those things. It's, it's, they eat through a lot of things. Um, how effective are the big belly um, trash cans in, in, within the city? Like I know we, sort of, we used we used them more a while ago, and they seem to be pulling back from using them. I, I would have to defer to Public Works around what the challenges are with with big bellies. I know they're mechanical with a compact, compactor inside. Um, if it contains trash and, and can reduce the access of, of uh, rats getting to uh, establish the trash as a food source, it, it's great. Um, we uh, recently uh, added new barrels to the Boston Commons rodent proof or rodent resistant barrels um, that are showing really good promise. Um, they're almost completely enclosed with a, an opening at the top. Um, but containerization and finding ways to, to if we're going to store trash to make sure that rats can't get into it is is important. But I don't know the specific challenges around the big, big bellies. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Council Murphy, any follow-up questions? No. Okay. I don't have any follow-up questions, but um, I do want to ask, do you have any closing remarks, any closing statements? Yeah, no, thank you for this opportunity. I think um, the more that we can talk about this in, in this type of setting and explore um, every single tool to, to make Boston less rat-friendly is, is welcomed. And so you know, we are your partners in this work, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Um, I look forward to also collaborating with you all to make sure that we find um, environmentally friendly solutions to make sure that we're getting rid of our rat population. Yeah. Well, thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We, have, we do have one um, Zoom public testimony um, that I want to make sure we get to, give them the opportunity. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. you. You have two minutes for public testimony. Thank you so much for joining. Sure, you may hear my cat in the background who has his own ideas for this solution. Um, thank you, City Council and committee members for hearing my testimony. My name is Caitlin McCartan and I live in West Roxbury, and I'm here to express my strong support for using birth control as a humane and effective alternative to poisons for managing rodent populations in our city. My husband and I talk a lot about the what ifs. What if we moved outside the city? What if we had a bigger house, a bigger backyard? What if we could give our kids a better connection to nature? Um, the other night, my kids and I were having dinner outside in our backyard. It was a beautiful night like we've been having. We stayed outside a while until it got after dark. And as we were sitting together, we heard the most amazing call from a tree in our backyard. It was a really beautiful sound that none of us had heard before. And of course, as part of the modern society that we live in, my husband ran inside, grabbed his phone, recorded the sound we were hearing, and we learned that it was an Eastern screech owl. So my kids and I had kind of this magic moment, you know, when you suddenly realize that you're not the only ones enjoying a night in your backyard, that we're actually surrounded by and sharing our space with amazing urban wildlife. And just last week, my son saw not one but two bald eagles soaring above us as we were driving on the highway. So I have those moments every now and then, and they push those what ifs a little farther away because I can still enjoy the culture and vibrancy of living in a city. And I can still find those magic moments of connection to wildlife from my backyard. So I thought about those moments when I was preparing my testimony for today and about the trickle-down effect of rodenticides on the food chain that we've been hearing about from the panelists. 
and that animals like eagles and owls who aren't even part of the problem are losing their lives and becoming poisoned when they eat those rodents. So today, I'm not testifying about saving the rats. I'm testifying about saving our urban wildlife and those connections to nature that we can still give our families from triple deckers and high rises and tiny backyards like mine right here in the city. So I hope that Boston will take a forward thinking and humane approach to controlling rodent populations and hope that we can serve as an example to other cities on how they can help preserve those magic moments and connections with nature for their residents too. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that is it for public testimony. Um, again, thank you all so much to the panelists, to the first panel, to the second panel, and to my colleagues for joining. Um, this hearing on docket number 1130 is adjourned.